the, the most common way that I've seen people talk about matter and form, and really the way that helped me as I was kind of reading through this, not you know, not just in this book, but as we over the past you know couple of years have been just you know generally talking about these various ideas of matter and form and, and how they're presented by Plato and by others, has been you know thinking about. I know there are some Christian thinkers that sort of describe the you know forms as being God's mind, right? And so God creates and creates matter, uh, and the form from which that matter comes was was all in God's mind. And so, you know, that sort of sense of, of this, first there is God's mind, and even today God has a mind, and, and, and even where there's maybe some level of progressive creation going on, that's, that's coming from those forms in, in, in God's mind. Yeah, so that's the way I've heard, that's the most common way I think I've, I've heard Christian deal with those issues. The other thing, as I was reading through this chapter, and, and actually it's, I think it is in the section that we're in, uh, you know, the section that deals with uh, Avicenna and some of his thinking. There is this concept of emanation. I'm not sure I totally understand the concept, but, you know, he, he describes, uh, Kukina describes, you know, what might giving existence or granting being entail. These are described as an emanation. There wasn't an apparent way to relate any of these descriptions to the recognized in causal explanations. And then this changes with Avicenna, who takes these elements from across the Hellenistic tradition and, and synthesizes them and puts emanation in this column of efficient causality. Now, I, I can't say I fully understand this concept, but it seems to me that as I was reading through this, this might actually be key concept for you know, Orthodox Christians who hold to an ex nihilo way, way of thinking uh, to sort of get at, well, what is it that some of these stick thinkers are thinking? And, and you know, is, is emanation then sort of, you know, pr providing some sort of, is, is that concept a way that we can sort of get a little more deeply into, into that, that way of thinking? And, and I'm interested, you know, I, I, was, I was looking forward to the opportunity to maybe ask you a little bit about nation and your thoughts on that. So I'm, I'm glad that we uh, got to this point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. Well, let me do that. Let me talk about emanation here in this section, and, and Kukonen really helps us here. So this is one of the strengths of the chapter. By way of getting to emanation, I wanted to maybe just check in with this idea of form and matter. Now, in the chapter, Kukonen talks about it as an Aristotelian thing, and it absolutely is. I mean, you know, it's clear that Aristotle articulate a very specific sort of mature philosophy of how the material, how matter and form relate to each other. And so material would be the matter part, but then form would be sort of the pattern or maybe the governing rules. And so in a sense, one can look at an apple. And when you look at that apple, you see the material of that particular apple but you also see the form of what might be um, appleness or <laughs> the union of all apples in terms of qualities. And I think Christianity offers an independent form material relationship. And I'm going to read this verse from Colossians chapter 1. And so it says in chapter 1, um, talking about the supremacy of the Son of God, it says this, the Son, and that's Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. And so just, a, just a, a, a verse or two here. Well, let me just read the passage. I'm sorry. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. Now here it comes. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. 
And so we have this picture of the Christ. The Son is the image of the invisible God. uh, God was pleased to have all of the fullness of God dwell in the Son. And so now we have this idea of differentiation between material and form in a, in a very uniquely Christian way. This is not Aristotelian. And so I think this is really a, a beautiful picture of how something, how the form and the matter can relate to each other. And, and there's, there's, it's worth more talk to talk about that, and we can spend more time, but I also wanted to check in with, your, with the, the question you talked about, emanation, because <clears throat> I really think emanation is, is the only other game in town as as Kukonen would would put things. And this is the idea that causes are contained in their effects. And so that's what it means to be imminent. And so we saw an early part of this in Thales. So if you remember Thales, he was one of the first Greek pre-Socratic philosophers. And Thales' big uh, idea was that everything was water. And while it's not completely clear what he meant, um, he appears to have been subtle enough that nobody is thinking that he was saying, you know, that a rock and a slab of metal and a glass of water were all containing the same thing. You know, so, so in other words, there is a distinction in material, but, but Thales' dogmatic faith, let's put it that way, was that in some fashion the one thing came from the other. And so, you know, the earth was formless and void. And in, in, in Thales' view, you have this idea that everything comes from or emanates from its original water nature. And so, sure, it's a lump of steel now, but it's only a lump of steel now because at some time in the past, through some creative organization, whether that's personal or impersonal is not exactly clear, but through some rearrangement of material, something that was once water has now become this lump of steel. And then the same thing with the rock. You know, what was once, it was once a lump of steel, but then it became, you know, it oxidized, it rusted away, and then it became something that over time became a rock. And now this person's holding this rock in his hands. And so Thales' idea of, of emanation was that when you're holding something in your hands that's absolutely clearly not water, it still is in some sense water because the material the material receptacle transitioned. So underneath there is a material receptacle that was originally water. And so others among the Greeks suggested other underlying monisms. And that's in fact where we get the quintessences, the five essences, earth, air, fire, water, and now you're asking, what's the fifth essence? Well, the fifth essence is that unknown, that quintessence, whatever it might be. And I think with quintessence, we make the transition from something material to something that puts us in this Aristotelian idea of form and matter. So something immaterial has to be present. And so, I don't know, does that help with the idea of emanation? I, I, I think it does. And you know, it's it's really interesting to think through then. Well, first of all, I, I think you're pointing to Colossians is is really a really uh, brilliant way to have Christians understand the idea of form and matter because you do you do see that you see that concept come through in, in a in a very you know in a very Christian way. But you you see that concept and there's there's very much a sense in which one can know that, you know, we know Plato and Aristotle, their ideas predate when, when Paul wrote those words, but, but there, we, we don't, we, you know, there doesn't appear to be a heavy, you know, a lot of people aren't going to point to that and say, well, it, you know, that's just, that's just Paul the Platonist or Paul the Aristotelian, you know, it, and it's, and so it's good to see sort of that, that, it's also a picture of common grace, right? It's a picture of there is some level, you know, we, we may not be entirely natural theologians, but there, there is a sense in which we can see that nature does reveal itself and God reveals himself through nature in, in certain ways, in ways that are, you know, not entirely 
visible to to non-believers, but but even so, he does uh, reveal himself. So that's a good reminder of that. And then you know, just that sense of emanation as being sort of the really the only other game in town makes a lot of sense uh, because now, you know, obviously, there are a lot of different ways in which that gets expressed in you know in modern philosophy or you know in various cosmologies that kind of thing but it is a helpful way to sort of you know get at the root of where where people are arguing and and also you know it, it's probably worth thinking about as we you know as we deal with these various different ideas you know a way of helping people to drill down when they're uh, when they're confronted with the new idea and they're confronted with the idea that hey this this sounds pretty good now let's drill down to where did, where does this idea come from and and just what sense is this you know does this rely on some of these basic principles and and this emanation principle is, is certainly one of them and it is really interesting how you know we do see in in the early uh, medieval uh, era we we see people first like Avicenna and then others who who really take hold of the idea and and, and how so much of what where we are today is is reliant on that.